Welcome to Data Structures with Professor Califf. Today I'd like to talk about the disjoint sets data structure. The problem we're trying to solve with this data structure is that we have a set of items. We have some sort of equivalence relation. For example, that could be things that are in the same room. Each item is initially in its own set, but then we need to update the structure to put two items in the same set and union those two sets together. We also need to be able to determine which set an item is in, which we'll call finding the item. We have some assumptions that we're going to make in order for this to work efficiently. First of all, we're going to have n items and they're going to be numbered from 0 to n minus 1. And we can determine the number of an item in constant time given the item. So we're going to always treat these items as just those numbers as far as our data structure is concerned. The basic idea here is that we're going to use an array to store a forest. Remember that a forest is just multiple trees. Each index of the array is going to represent one of our items. We're going to use minus one as the value at that spot in the array to represent the root of a tree. And then the index of that location will be the label for the set represented in that tree. Non-negative array values are going to be the index of the parent of this item in the tree. So this would be what an initial disjoint set of 10 items would look like. We have 10 different sets, 10 different trees. Each item is the root of its own tree. So here's a graphical representation of those 10 trees. First of all, let's talk about the find operation. For that, we're going to go to the array at the index of the item. We'll follow the pointers up the tree, those values in the array, until we reach the root, which will have value minus one. The set name then will be the index of that root. Here I have an array with two disjoint sets in it. Here's the tree representation so that it's easier for us to follow what's going on in the array. One thing to remember through all of this is that the computer only has the array. All of the drawings of trees are just for us humans to understand them more easily. I want to find five. I'm going to start at index five. It has value zero, so we go look at index zero. That has value one, so we're going to move on to index one. That has value two, so we can move on to the two. That has value minus one, so we know that we're at the root of the tree, and the label we're going to use for this set is two. Now, we don't always have to climb the tree. If we go to find eight, then we're going to start at index eight, and we're going to see, oh, this is a root, so our set is eight. So that's our find operation. The union operation is a slightly more complex because we're trying to union the two sets together. So the first thing we're going to do, we always union two items. We're going to first go locate the roots of the trees for those items. We're going to point the root of the second arguments tree at the root of the first arguments tree, turning them into one big tree. Union should only be done after confirming that the items are in different sets. And of course, we'll discover if we go to find those items as we find the roots, we have the same thing. We certainly don't want to point it at itself. So here's an example, unioning four and one. So we're first going to go do a find with the four, locating its root. So that takes us up to the eight. Then we're going to do the same thing with the one, taking us up to the two. Then finally, we're going to point the two, which was the root of the second argument, at the eight, which was the root for the first argument. And so we change the value at two to eight. Now you may ask, why roots? That looks like extra work. So let's look and see what happens. Let's take a look at unioning three and nine. Suppose that I don't use roots at all. In that case, I'm just going to point the nine at the three. But remember, the point of all of this was to union the two trees together. If we point the nine at the three, we haven't actually unioned the two trees. We've left most of our second set behind. So we moved only part of that second set to the first set. 
Suppose we climb to the top of the tree for that second argument and just point it at the first argument. That works. We have successfully unioned the two trees, but we're going to end up with a very tall and skinny tree. This means we'll have more expensive find operations. These trees are like all, pretty much all other trees we run into in data structures. We don't like tall, skinny trees. We like short, bushy trees. They are always more efficient. No exception here. To achieve that, we want to make roots point at roots. So let's think a little bit. So far, we've just been looking at what we call arbitrary unions, where we always just point the second argument at the first argument. Work through an example here. First of all, I'm in a union one and two, and I'm only gonna worry about the tree representation for this. So that's gonna make the two point at the one. Then suppose I union three and one. So that's going to make the one point at the three. Then I union four and three, that makes the three point at the four. And then I'm in a union five and four, and that will make the four point at the five. So I said I didn't like tall skinny trees, I just produced a very tall, very skinny tree. And this is always a risk with arbitrary unions. There are two possible solutions to this problem. One is called union by size, where we're going to keep track of the size of the tree, the number of items in it. And then we're going to always point the smaller tree at the larger if they're different sizes. We also have union by height, where we're going to keep track of the actual height of the tree and always point the shorter tree at the taller tree if they have different heights. Note that the same size and height will follow our arbitrary rule, pointing the second one at the first. So let's see what these actually look like. First, the by size implementation. We need a place to store the height. So what we're gonna do is we're just going to use that negative value that we've been using just minus one we're gonna change that to store the height of the tree, actually the negative of the height of the tree. Then when we do our union, we're going to change the value of the root of the larger tree to the sum of the two heights. And of course, we're gonna change the value of the root of the smaller tree to point at the root of the larger tree, just as we did before. And this is how we're going to keep track of our heights. Notice that storing the size of the tree is going to allow us to efficiently know when all items have been unioned together, which for many applications of disjoint sets turns out to be a really useful thing to know. So let's look through a little bit of an example. I'm unioning two and one. They're the same size. We see that because they both have minus one. Notice that starting with minus one for all of our trees does start them all with the correct size. Then we're gonna point one at two because that's the direction of our arbitrary union. And notice that we modified the value at two so that it's now minus two, adding the two negative ones together. Then I'm gonna union three and one. I first have to find my roots. Set two will be the larger of those. Notice that when I'm doing the comparisons, I'm typically going to be doing that with smaller as opposed to larger because I'm working with negative numbers. So we always have to think about our implementation. Set two is the larger, so we want to point the three at the two. And we'll add the minus two and the minus one together to get minus three in index two. Then when we go to union four and three, we first again have to go find the roots. So we go up to the two Set two is larger, so we need to point the four at the two. And of course, we also add the minus three and the minus one together to get minus four. So I hope you can see that this solves the problem that we were having with our unions with the arbitrary set. Instead of getting a tall, skinny tree, we're getting a nice, short, bushy tree. And because of the nature of our tree, these are not binary trees. We can point as many items at the root as we want to. So we can have very short, flat trees, which is good. So let's think a little bit about our union by size. Note that it's not gonna guarantee the shortest tree. There are times when we may end up with a taller tree that has fewer items than a larger tree. We're going to point the 
taller, fewer items tree at the shorter, many items tree, which will not give us the best result in terms of height. So it's not perfect, but it does tend to produce shorter trees than the arbitrary approach will. And we'll see that in some of our applications in some of the other videos I have, knowing the size of the tree is convenient. Let's now talk just a little bit about union by height implementation. We use the same concept as we use for size, but instead of storing the number of nodes as a negative, we're going to store the actual height of the tree as a negative. If tree heights differ, we're going to simply point the shorter tree at the taller tree and notice that the result will be the same height as the taller tree. If the tree heights are different, we're going to point the shorter tree at the taller tree and note that in that case, the height of the tree is going to be the same as the taller tree. So we won't make any changes to the height in that case. If the heights are the same, then we're going to use the arbitrary rule, but we're going to add one to the height of the first tree, the one that we're pointing at, because the overall height will increase by one in that case. So let's again work through a little bit of an example. If we look at unioning two and one, we're going to have the same heights. So we're going to point the one at the two and add one, actually subtract one, because we're talking about negatives to the height of the tree. When we go to union three and one, we're going to find the roots again. That's two, set two is taller since it has the larger magnitude, smaller value. So we point the three at the two. Now notice those heights were different. So the height of the tree has not changed. It is still two. And this would be true if we continued the same example as we were doing with the sizes, we would just end up with everything pointing at the two, just as we do with size. But I want to show you a little bit of how things will be a little different. So let's go ahead and union four and five here. Those are going to be same heights. And so we're going to point the five at the four and of course, increase the height of the tree. Then I want to union the five and the three. So we're going to find the roots of both. So we climb to the two and the four. They do have the same heights again. And so we're going to use our arbitrary rule, point two at four. Now notice that this is different from height. One of these had more items than the other. So we would have pointed the four at the two, but we're only looking at height. We're going to point two at four, increase the height to three. Union by height is going to guarantee to us that we get the shortest possible tree that we can get from unions alone. However, union by height is not usually our choice. We usually stick with union by size. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is that in the next video, we're going to look at an approach to improving the tree height that does not interact well with union by height because we would lose track of what the heights actually are but does work well with union by size. We do find it convenient to know how big the trees are, especially to know when we have done the union that causes all of the things to be in the same set. And there's no convenient way to do that with union by height. So I hope this has given you a little bit of an idea of what disjoint sets are all about. In the next video, we'll talk a little bit about path compression, which is a way of improving our trees as we do our finding. You can also check out a couple of videos that um, look at applications of disjoint sets. The minimum spanning trees using Kruskal's algorithm uses disjoint sets. And I have a video on creating random mazes using disjoint sets. So feel free to check those out. I'll see you next time.